About a month ago, I discovered a bug in my compiler. And while compiler bugs are never fun, this one was particularly annoying, because it only happened in somewhat obscure code that you'd hopefully never write in practice. And fixing it would have required a fundamental rework of my compiler. Which, of course, is what I ended up doing. But before we talk about that, let's have a look at this bug and why it's so hard to fix. So here's the simplest example demonstrating the bug. Running this code with my old compiler would have printed 4, which supposedly is not correct. So let's step through the code to see what it should actually do. Well, first we create the a variable, so a is now 1. Then we evaluate the argument of the print function. We have a, which is 1. Then we increment a, so a is now 2. And then we return a from this block, which is 2. Now we have 1 plus 2, which is 3. So it should have printed 3. And in other languages, this is indeed what happens. So here's the example ported to Python. We create the a variable, and then we have to use this function, because Python doesn't have block expressions. So we increment a and return it. And running this code in Python does actually print 3. And here's the same example in Lua. We use a local variable and a function, because just like Python, Lua doesn't have block expressions either. But when we run it, we actually get 4. So Lua actually doesn't get this right either. And I've talked previously about how my language was inspired by Lua, although this is not exactly what I meant with that. But it is no coincidence that both Lua and my language messed this up. But we'll talk about that later. First, let's see how the Python compiler works and why the code it generates is correct. Python's compiler is pretty standard for a dynamic interpreted language, meaning it starts out with the source code as a string, which is parsed into an abstract syntax tree, and that is then turned into bytecode, which is executed by a virtual machine at runtime. And the Python virtual machine is what's known as a stack machine, meaning operations always operate at the top of the stack. So the binary add, for example, pops the top two values, adds them, and pushes the result back onto the stack. And this makes code generation fairly straightforward. We just start at the root of the syntax tree, which in this case is an addition. So we know eventually we'll have to use binary add. But first we need to push the operands. So we start with the left operand, which is a variable. So we push its value onto the stack using the load fast instruction. And then we visit the second operand. This is another addition, so eventually we'll have to binary add. But again, first we need to push the operands. So b is another variable, and c as well. So that's the idea behind the Python code generator. In practice, it uses a recursive function called compiler visit expert one, which has a bunch of cases for all of the different expressions in Python. Now, here I've highlighted two of them. The binary operation, which first visits the children, as we've done in the example, and then adds the instruction for the binary operation. And here's one for constants like numbers, so 42 or the string hello. And that just adds an instruction to load the constant. Now let's go back to the original example. We'll be looking at the bytecode for the argument to the print function, which if you remember should be 3. So again we have an addition, so we have a binary add preceded by the operands. So first the value of a is pushed onto the stack using load global, so in this case that's 1. And then there's a code for calling the function f, which increments a and then returns 2. So we have 1 and 2 on the stack, and that's how we get 3. But, as I've explained in the past, stack-based virtual machines like Python's aren't the most efficient, and that's because they have to do all of this loading before getting to the actual work. Register-based virtual machines, on the other hand, encode the operands in the instructions themselves, so they don't need any of these copies, and this entire computation can be done in just two instructions. And that's why Lua and my language also use register-based virtual machines. But, today we're not talking about performance, today we're talking about correctness. And it can be a little tricky to generate register-based code that is both efficient and correct. To understand why, let's see how my old compiler handles this code. And which, by the way, is also how Lua does it, and where I got the inspiration from to do it that way. Like in Python's compiler, we also start at the root of the syntax tree. And because that's an addition, we know eventually we'll want to generate the add instruction. But we don't yet know which registers to use. To figure that out, we again visit the operands. And here's where it gets interesting, because A is a variable, and all variables have a dedicated register. So we don't actually have to generate any code for A. We can just tell the add instruction to use the register 0, which is where a is. So next we visit the second operand. Again, that's an addition, so we generate the add instruction eventually, but first we'll have to figure out what the operands are. Those are variables again, so we just use the registers where the variables already are, for b and for c. Now on the way up, we have to decide what register to use for the output. We'll just use some kind of free register, like register 3 for example. And then we propagate that to the parent, and this one, again, has to choose some kind of register for the result. We'll just use register 4, for example. But you may have noticed something odd, which is that in the stack-based code, we first loaded A before doing any of the other operations. But in the register-based code, 
A is being accessed after the first edition. So if, say, for some reason this edition had changed the value of A, this wouldn't actually be a correct compilation of the code. And in fact, if we replace this addition b plus c with a block which, say, increments a and returns it, in other words, the original code, we actually get a bug. Because we first increment a, so it's 2, and then we add a to itself, and that's how we get 4. So how can we fix this? Well, the issue is that the addition down here is using the new value of a after it has been incremented. And that's because when processing this a node, we didn't generate any code for it. We just told the add node to use register 0, which is where a's value was. But in doing so, we assumed that the other operand wouldn't change a's value anymore. But in this case it did, so what we should have done was generate a copy for a, and then use the copied value. But we have to be a little bit careful, because if we now conclude that we should always generate copies for variables, then in this case we end up with three copies, and none of them would achieve anything because no variables are being modified. So it's a bit tricky. In one case we want to make sure we copy the value because it's being modified, and in the other one we don't because there are no modifications. So we may start coming up with some kind of rule, like for example if we have a binary operator, the left hand side is a variable and the right hand side is a block, that means the block may contain assignments to the variable, so therefore we should copy the value of a. But the issue with that would be that the block doesn't have to be a direct child of the operator, it could also be further down the tree, or it may actually not contain any assignments, or no assignments to the variable that we're using up here. And furthermore, this problem doesn't just occur with binary operators, but also in tuples and function calls, and any feature that I might add in the future which sequentially evaluates expressions. So solving this issue directly would be a lot of complexity, just to fix a bug that hopefully never occurs in practice, because people don't write this kind of code. And it wouldn't have any benefits either, like the code doesn't get any better, we just make sure it's correct. So at this point, I basically had two options. Either I was going to ignore the bug for a while, or I was going to find a proper solution to it now. And because eventually I wanted to add compiler optimizations anyway, I thought now is a good time as any to figure out how to do that. So now let's talk about the rework. Previously my compiler worked basically like Python's or Lua's, where we go from source text to syntax tree to bytecode. But as we've seen, doing optimizations in the code generation phase when going from abstract -like syntax tree to bytecode can be a little error prone. And in general, these optimizations have very small scope and can't really have that much impact on runtime performance. So what optimizing compilers do instead is add another stage between syntax tree and bytecode, usually called intermediate representation, which isn't a very descriptive name, but oh well. In my case, the intermediate representation, or IR, is very close to the bytecode in that it is based on instructions and can't have any complex expressions like in the source text. But the idea of using the IR is now that when going from syntax tree to IR, we don't actually try to generate the optimized code, we just generate the code that is definitely going to be correct. In other words, making copies of all of the variables. And then we use an optimizer, which gets rid of copies that aren't actually needed. So in this case, that's all of them. And here's the other example with the block that increments A. Again, when going from syntax tree to IR, we just generate the naive code with all of the copies, and the optimizer then gets rid of the ones that it can remove. But in this case, the first copy can't be removed because the variable A is assigned between the definition and the use. And then at the end, when we're done optimizing, we again just copy to bytecode. Because the IR is so close to bytecode, that's basically a one-to-one -one translation. Though I should mention that the IR isn't actually bytecode. So bytecode is, well, an array of bytes, which is optimized for execution and compactness. But the intermediate representation is a graph-like data structure, which is optimized for modifications, so adding and removing instructions. Alright, so this whole idea with the IR and the optimizer seems like a pretty good idea. But now we have a new issue, which is how do we write this optimizer, and how does it know which copies it can get rid of? Alright, so here's the idea behind this copy optimization. If you have some kind of operation where one of the operands is a copy of some kind of variable, and this variable is not assigned between making the copy and using the copy, then instead of the copy we can just use the variable itself. And if now this copy is no longer used, then we can get rid of the copy as well. To make this a bit more concrete, here's the example again where a is incremented. We start off with the unoptimized code, where we make copies of the variables for the uses. And now down here we have an operation where the operands are copies. The first operand is a copy of a up here, however between the copy and the use of the copy, a is assigned, so we can't forward this copy. But that's not the case for this other copy, so we can use a here instead. And now there are no more other uses of this second copy, so we can remove it. Now in this case it was fairly easy to just eyeball it, where are the copies, where are the assignments, but in general there can be a lot of code between a copy and the use of the copy. And there could also be control flow like loops, conditionals, function calls, stuff like that. 
So it could be fairly expensive and complicated to figure out whether there is actually an assignment between the definition and the use of the copy. And instead of coming up with some kind of algorithm myself, I decided to Google how other people have solved this problem. So I came across this Wikipedia article about copy propagation, and they describe exactly the problem that we're trying to solve. And they explain that copy propagation often makes use of reaching definitions, use def chains, and def use chains. And because I've looked into some compiler optimizations before, I know that these things are also fairly complicated and potentially slow. So I decided to ask on the Handmade Network language dev channel. And so I sat down, described my problem, gave some examples and ideas for fixing it. And a couple of minutes later, I had my answer. Ratchet Freak said, SSA solves that issue by making all registers read only. And I was like, oh, of course, that makes so much sense. Like, look, if you have this code, and we know that all registers are only ever assigned once, are read only, then it doesn't matter what code there is. When we see i0, we know, well, that's a, and when we see a, we know that's one. It's really that simple. Except, of course, there is an issue. Because variables, well, they're not read only. Variables can be changed. So what if the user tries to increment the variable? How do we do that? Well, actually, there's a pretty simple answer. We just use version numbers. So this variable initially is just a1, and the incremented version is then a2. And that's the idea behind this thing called static single assignment form, which is the technique used in all the major compilers for imperative languages. And here on the Wikipedia page, they also talk about the version numbers and how this can replace reaching definition analysis. Now, while I would like to explain more about SSA, how to use it and how to implement it, we really don't have the time for that in this video, although I might talk about it in the future. But before closing out, I want to address one more issue, which is how do we deal with this code, where we have a variable which is assigned conditionally. If we just start versioning the variables, then up here we have a1, down here we have a2, but now the question is, which version do we use in the print? We kind of have to use a2 if foo was true, and otherwise we have to use a1. Well, while this might seem kind of weird and unintuitive, it's actually totally well defined mathematically. So what we do in static single assignment form is we insert another version after the conditional, version 3, which we then use down here, and we use this kind of weird logic where depending on where we came from in the control flow, we use different versions. And usually this idea is encapsulated in a magic function called pi. Again, this is also explained on the Wikipedia article, linked below. And while I would also like to talk about how my new compiler works in detail, again, this is probably not the video for that. So instead, I want to give you a quick overview. So here's an example of how the compiler processes a Fibonacci function. As usual, first the source code is parsed into an abstract syntax tree, which I've omitted here and then the abstract syntax tree is converted into the intermediate representation. In the first step, local variables are still implemented using these getLocal and setLocal instructions. And then the first optimization pass I've called local to reg. usually this would be called mem to reg, which then gets rid of these setLocal and getLocal instructions and replaces them using phi functions and copy instructions. And then here we finally get to do what we always wanted, which was forwarding copies. So for example, here is an addition which uses i16 and i17, which are copies defined just above it, and after copy propagation has been done, it uses the values those other instructions had copied. Now in the next step, we get rid of these copies if they're no longer used. In this case, actually all of the copies can be removed, and this is fairly common. So now we have code which actually looks very similar to the final bytecode, although there is one issue. We're still using phi functions, and the bytecode doesn't have any phi instructions, and physical CPUs don't have them either. So this last step of the pipeline is about removing phi instructions and allocating registers. This part alone probably took me like two weeks to figure out. Again, I've linked the most useful resources down below. So yeah, that's how the new compiler works. It's probably like four or five times as complicated as the old one, but it also does a lot more. And it lays the foundation for doing more optimizations in the future. And if you guys want to learn more about how it works, please let me know down in the comments. For now, that's going to be it. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.